All right, welcome back to the second part of this video, uh, the second part of this project, which is to reverse engineer a uh, SCSI CD-ROM player, which is written in BASIC. Uh, so if you haven't watched the first uh, part of this video, you should do that first, because um, I'm basically just going to dive back in where I left off last night. So what we have, what we have been doing is uh, we have been uh, working our way through the CD player basic program listing uh, natively on the Commodore 128. Uh, and I have been making, I've made two columns of um, notes. So the left column is a list of routines. We have our line numbers where the routine starts, and I have sort of a name of what the routine is. And then on the uh, right-hand side, we have the list of variables. We have these sort of two-letter variables, two or one-letter variables. And then I've started to write notes about what it is that I think those variables are based on what's in the program, and we have a couple of gaps that we're still trying to figure out. Um, and I did have some insights, actually, since last night, which I will be happy to uh, explain. So first we're going to list our uh, directory of partitions at dollar sign equals P. Okay, so we're going to go to uh, partition 7 for our audio partition. Slap the F1 key to list the directory. Here's our CD player directory. CD player. Okay. And uh, this program here is the one that has been self modified to already contain the uh, logical unit number and the SCSI ID of the CD ROM that's been detected. So let's load this up and run it just for fun. Just to recall what we're doing. Okay, reading table of contents. I assume it's reading the table of contents. Now I'm also going to assume, by the way, that in assembly this is going to be a lot faster. So let's say that just took, I mean it wasn't super long, what was that, maybe 10 seconds? If that's 10 seconds in basic, I'm guessing that an implementation in assembly would be almost instantaneously fast. I mean, basic, people say basic's about a thousand times slower than assembly, depending on what you're doing. So, I mean, 10 seconds might be turned into a fraction of a second. So that's pretty cool. So let's see what happens when we hit R. Okay. There we go. Pick the track. Now, I haven't actually got this far in the program, but I am wondering if random is built into his program, or whether random is built into, let's turn that down, or whether random is built into uh, the CD-ROM itself. I'm going to guess it's probably built into his program, um, but you never know, I might be surprised. So let's hit next track here and see what happens next tunnel. Oh, now that was interesting. It went straight from 10 to 11. Okay, next title. Back to one. Next title. Oh, next title was two. Oh, so next title was nine. Okay, 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 good. Sorry, I'm just exploring some new features now that we hadn't actually looked at um, last night. And why am I doing that? Well, because it's going to become relevant when we get into the main program uh, routine shortly. So for a second there, I, I thought, I mean, 10 went to 11, 11 went to 1, I thought 11 wrapped around 1. So I thought that maybe at random, random play picked the random first track and then after that they were all in sequence. but. Then it went from 1 to 9, and then from 9 back to 1, so that's, 
a true random, by the way. I remember Steve Jobs uh, standing on a stage and laughing about how uh, they originally made the shuffle play in iTunes be random and people didn't like it, so they made it less random. <laughs> uh, actually, the way that works, it, it's it's kind of the um, it's the bus at the bus stop problem if you've ever encountered that in uh, statistics or math or whatever, where um, Basically, uh, if you simply roll a die, if we have 11 tracks and you just roll a die for what track to play next, every so often you're going to roll uh, the same number three times in a row. And it's like, yeah, but you know what? People don't want to hear the track, the same track three times in a row. So what makes more sense is you make an array of all the tracks and you shuffle the locations of the tracks and then you play through the shuffled list before you reshuffle and you do it all again. And maybe if you reshuffle, you make sure that the last track you played doesn't become the, the, the first track you played. So that, you know, it's a little less random than random, but it feels better to people. Let's uh, hit plus again. Okay, four. So it's definitely, uh, it's definitely in random mode. Um... Yeah, anyway, let's get out of here. And the program is now in memory. So, uh, you know, the other thing I was thinking about when I uploaded my video to um, YouTube was I was like, oh crap, is this program copyrighted? And uh, it has this block and it definitely has credits about the dates and who uh, wrote it. But there are no copyrights, interestingly enough. So that's kind of uh, useful. All right. Uh, <clears throat> for our list of routines, we basically worked through the init, the main program, the jump, uh, yeah, the main pro, no, we have not actually worked through the main program, but we know that the main program is going to be at line 60,000. Then we have a SCSI command, a bunch of SCSI commands. An inquiry, that's for, um, that's done during detection of the SCSI devices. Request sets, which is obviously useless, according to what the code says, which basically just falls through to the actual SCSI command send. So all the other commands compose a string and then call SCSI command send. So the command inquiry, and then the command uh, test unit ready, which I don't think we've encountered yet. Then we have read table of contents, which is a bit complicated and we decided not to dive into it. And then we have this other command down here for starting and stopping the unit, but I'm not exactly sure what that even means yet. Now, if we come back up here, we also had a routine called play MFS. And at the last night, I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but I, I have an idea now that came to me in the interim. Read the subchannel, uh, basically um, it updates the user interface for how much time is remaining and then it does it scans the um, keyboard for input. And I had a little insight on that that I'll return to as well. Um, then we have these conversion routines, MFS to LBN and LBN to MFS, plus we had this hundredth minute to seconds converter. And what this 100 minute to seconds converter did was it um, it outputs, so it takes something in, it takes an integer in A and it returns an A string. And the result is uh, minutes. And then after the minutes, you have a full colon. And then after the full colon, you have a seconds. Well, M for minutes, F for full colon and S for seconds looks shockingly like MFS. So now I'm thinking that uh, I s so now I'm thinking that MFS might mean minutes, seconds, and LBN. I started thinking, well, what what might that mean? Well, we do have this block length, and you have a sequence of uh, blocks. So I'm thinking that LBN might mean logical block number, where a block consists of 1 75th of a second. 
So you have basically, you have the ability to convert between MFS and LBN and LBN to MFS. Now play MFS, I'm not sure, but maybe it has the ability to play from a certain time offset. Not sure, we can, we can reinvestigate that. The other little piece of thing that I, um, that I made a bit of a, a discovery on. It was some, this was something in um, Read Subchannel. Let's let's hop there before we go any further. So Read Subchannel did this user interface stuff, and then it queries the device, and it um, gets the time, and then it uh, converts the time, and then uh, it pops the new times into the user interface to to show you the updated sort of length remaining and how much you've played so far and that sort of stuff. But then it has this little block here. Uh, where's my pencil? So it has this little block here, which I spent quite a bit of time on because I really love this trick here, right? Now, one of the things that I was confused about, so T, I, I, I thought maybe that was some kind of a command, but I now believe that T, T just stands for track. So I'm going to actually just pen that in. T equals track. Or uh, sometimes the, this, the guy that wrote this program is calling it title, all right? Previous title, next title. But, uh, so you think, well, that's obvious. Yeah, title. Why didn't I figure that out last night? But I'll tell you why. Because some things, th this confused me. Because if you hit this back arrow, then it sets T equal to LK plus one, and I wasn't quite sure what LK stood for, so I thought T was some kind of a command. Uh, <clears throat> but what, um, when we get down into uh, this minus, we're gonna go back a, a track. I was confused, I love this trick, but I was confused by the fact that no matter whether you're in, you're at track one or not, T always ends up being a negative number. So if you're not at track zero, sorry, if, you're, if T is not equal to one, then this resolves to zero. So let's say we're at track uh, four. This resolves to zero. Therefore, when we hit minus, we want to go back from track four to track three right? So t will become equal to t minus 2. So track 4 will become track 2. And then minus 0 doesn't change anything. And so track 4 has become track 2. But we wanted to just go minus 1. So you see that that confused me, you see. But when I was reviewing my own video, after I uploaded it to YouTube, I realized that, you know, when you push plus, that you want to go forward, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't do anything to T. You see, it's not like it takes T and goes T equals T plus 1, and then here this says T equals T minus 1, as long as T is not equal to 1. And so my assumption here is that the reason that plus doesn't do anything is because t is probably already one track ahead of where it's supposed to be. And so if you hit plus, it's going to simply play the track that T already holds. But when you, because T's already ahead one track, it's as though, you know, you're playing three, but T's already four. So that's why it subtracts two. That's just a guess. We'll, we'll, we'll see later, but I had that thought only because T doesn't get incremented here. The other thing I, uh, I, I spent so long talking about this that I completely skipped this guy here. 
and I'm not entirely sure what PE is equal it represents. It's a 512 byte array. So it is often used, I believe, as just a, a free buffer into which um, if we do some sort of a SCSI command and the SCSI command then writes data into the CMD hard drive's memory buffer at 3000 and then you uh, uh, and then you issue a memory read command for however many bytes the response is probably supposed to be. Um, that puts that number of bytes, sort of queues up that number of bytes to be read from the error channel. And then you start reading from the error channel and you need to put those somewhere. You, you, you need to put those bytes somewhere. So my guess is that PE is simply the buffer in the computer's memory where the program is expected to have some free two pages of memory into which you can read, you can do memory reads from the hard drive's buffer. Now, depending on what SCSI command you've issued, it's not like every SCSI command you issue is going to produce a 512 bytes of data, right? So many of them produce just one. But I imagine that when we get into reading the table of contents, we're going to find that the table of contents, you issue some table of contents command in SCSI, SCSI command, and it's going to dump a bunch of that data into the 3000 hex 8 kilobyte buffer in the hard drive. And then we're going to dump it into PE. This is just a guess again. We're probably going to read it into PE and then maybe parse it out into the track data two-dimensional array. Maybe not, but that's, that's, that's my hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> therefore, PE1, I think these arrays in BASIC, thanks to Microsoft, are zero, not zero, are, are one-based. So one is, is, is the very first uh, one. So what that means is that I think I was mistaken in something else I said last night. The reason I was mistaken is because I failed to even look at what this does. So I said, I said that I thought this whole subroutine, um, which we called read subchannel, was not itself a loop, but was just a unit that gets called as part of the program's larger loop. And that therefore what it does is it does some UI updating, reads some SCSI data, does some more UI updating, checks the keyboard, but then ultimately returns, right? And that therefore it's some other part of the program would then maybe check what you had pressed, and then recall this subsection in a loop. That's not what happens. What happens is that uh, it... Let's go back to 28. Let's just list from 28 again. So what happens is uh, it updates the user interface. Okay. Let's switch to lowercase text mode. It updates the user interface. Then it makes these, it makes this remaining time SCSI um, call and uh, issues the command via 4000, sends the command to the device rather, checks to see, um, so TF, I don't know if I ever wrote TF down. I don't think I ever wrote TF down, because I didn't really get too deep into this. Um, but in any case, so TF is uh, zero. So if FE is, if, if issuing this command to check the time remaining 
is suddenly not okay, it sets TF to one and returns, so it, it leaves. And I'm thinking, well, why would it do that? Um, well, maybe if you were playing and the user just uh, moved down and went boom and popped the CD out. It's like, whoa, uh, well, we were in the middle of playing, but all of a sudden it can't possibly be playing anymore. And so now all of a sudden maybe this SCSI command will fail and it'll leave this routine. That's, that, that's a possibility. Otherwise, given that this SCSI routine worked, not only is it going to give us some time remaining, but it's, it's going to give us some other information. Okay, I don't actually have any docs on what this command does, nor what the response from it is. However, we do do this memory read of 15 bytes. So presumably, either this SCSI command only gives us 15 bytes, or we only really give a crap about the first 15 bytes. And uh, so here we are uh, looping over the 15 bytes, and here we are um, popping it into this array. And uh, actually this array is zero byte, is zero based. Look at that. Well, i equals zero. So maybe the array is zero based. Anyway, um, it grabs the 15 bytes and shoves them into this PE buffer, okay? Which is just what I said a second ago, right? That, that the SCSI command puts it into the hard drives buffer. Then we do a memory read, but it's like, okay, well, uh, but what are we gonna do with all these? What are we gonna do with the response data? It's like, I suppose we could process it one byte at a time, but that might be very inconvenient. So the better thing to do is just to read in a little loop here, boom, 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 boom all the memory read bytes uh, off the channel 15, put them into PE. I mean, it's probably some sort of German word, right? Like P might stand for puffer and E might stand for something else. So my guess is this is just, um, PE has got to be the uh, SCSI buffer in memory. So let's call it in memory SCSI data buff. Okay? In memory, as in the computer's memory, not the hard drive. Um, okay, and so after we've uh, grabbed all those um, bytes. Then uh, it starts acting on those bytes. And so here's a perfect example of where, you know, we could do this, we could do these operations on these bytes one at a time, but you know, given that we have to go get and it goes into something, it's a lot more convenient to be able to put them all in line and just say, okay, from our buffer, uh, 13, and then from our buffer 14, and then from our buffer 15, we can just, especially if these came out of order, right, imagine they came in some other order. So this does some conversion possibly to uh, hundredths of a minute, is that possible? hundredths of a minute or something, okay, only to be converted by 3600, right? So 3600 is that one hundredth of a minute to seconds, uh, and then we print that out. Now, here's the thing that I wasn't paying attention to, though, is that not only does that SCSI command give us the time signature, but that's in byte 13, 14, and 15. Yes, but we read 15 bytes, right? So, sorry, I, I'm i still trying to figure out now just off the cuff whether this makes any sense because, uh, you know, this whole, is it zero based or is it not zero based? Because the for loop does I to 14 so i is going to start at 0, 
and it's going to put PE 0 and then the first byte. Then it's going to loop, so I should be 1. And so basically it's going to, so the indexes for PE should be 0 to 14. But then in the very next line we, we go 13, 14, and 15? I, I wouldn't have thought that if we read 15 bytes and it's 0 to 14 that 15 shouldn't have anything in it. I don't know. I don't know where that 15 comes from or whether I'm misinterpreting this county yuppie loop. Let's, uh, let's not go guessing completely. I have my programmer's reference guide here, but you know what? Let's not even do that. Let's just, uh, let's just define a variable like, uh, create a new program. We'll go 10 equals, uh, we'll go a, uh, a percent, why not, because it's the same as that. Um, we'll go dim a percent, we'll say 5, okay. We'll go 20, we'll a percent, zero equals uh, 99, 30, one is gonna be 98, 40, two, 97, 50, three, 96, 60, Five. Let's just see if I did that meaningfully. Did I miss one? I did miss one, didn't I? Shit. We'll make that one five. We'll make this one four. And we'll make this one say, 45, three, six. Okay, this is just to see which of these is going to fail. Will five fail because it's zero based, or will zero fail because it's one based? So let's give that a whirl. No syntax errors, right? So now let's go a percent zero. I gave us 99. I mean, it certainly looks like it's zero based, right? But what's gonna happen with a five? It's goddamn 94. All right, I got another idea. Let us try this. 70 a percent six equals 93. And now it's gonna give us a busted index, isn't it? Watch this, bad subscript. Indeed, okay. So, ergo, looks to me as though when you put five in there, it's like its length is actually five plus one, or that the index five is the last acceptable index. Because, but zero also works, right? Zero holds 99. Okay, 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 I can deal with that. Let's, let's load our program back in. 2800, yeah. Okay. Okay. So that explains why this is not a bad subscript. It would never have been a bad subscript because we initially defined it as being 512 big. It still doesn't look like we're writing one of these bytes. I mean, this 15 is truly only 15 bytes. So this 15 it's just weird i don't i don't I, I think this might be a bug yeah i think this might be a bug i think this is a bug because that whatever's in 15 is either zero or it's some other number from a previous scuzzy call and whatever number it is it is so 
goddamn small because it's divided by 4,500 that it is irrelevantly insignificant, that it doesn't matter. But to be honest, it just looks like a bug to me. In any case, we have this is checking for 13, 14, and 15 as indexes, but you know, we read 15 bytes, right? So we've got a byte somewhere at like, you know, what do all the bytes from zero up mean? And I don't know, but if we don't push a back arrow or a plus or a minus, well then it checks to see whether the byte in the buffer, the memory buffer at one is equal to 21. If it is not equal to 21, it loops. 2840. 2840. 2840. Okay. Ah, very clever, very clever, very clever. I see. You know, because this was another thing that I was curious about. Uh, we know that these three, so this L is a, a pre-composed uh, string of 40 spaces. So this crap here that's uh, printing out part of the, so this, this S is probably a clear screen. Let's just test that. Uh, it's not a clear screen, it's, it's a home. It's a home. Okay, in any case, um, this is overwriting part of the UI, okay? And this is overwriting part of the UI. And then this is clearing out these lines. And I thought, you know, if this whole thing gets called again, and it clears out these lines before making the SCSI call, the SCSI call is going to take some noticeable duration of time, which is going to leave the screen, these lines cleared, only for them to get filled back in. Uh, but we, we should be seeing this sort of time sort of blinking. So I was thinking it didn't really make sense that this whole unit would be getting called by something else because we'd see that time blinking. But now what we see is that, so we, we compose, the, we, we set up the UI, we compose the SCSI command, stashed into um, SC, SCSI command. Then we call the SCSI command at 4000. Okay. Then we do the memory read into the buffer. Uh, we do a computation on the time. We fill in just the time parts of the UI. And then, uh, if nothing is pushed on the keyboard and buffers index one is not 21, so 21 might mean track is over, maybe, in whatever the SCSI response is. Uh, and if so, if it's not 21, well then it actually doesn't go back at the beginning of this, it goes back up to 2840. And all that does is it recalls the same SCSI command that we have already composed, which is just the fetch time SCSI command, and it gets a whole new response into the buffer, updates just the time, so we don't see any time blinking, and it just repeats. So actually, read subchannel is a loop, and pushing something on the keyboard breaks out of that loop. Which means, which means that if we do not push plus, where are we for time? 34 minutes. If we do not push plus, this keeps looping. If we do push plus, it's gonna go down here and return, and therefore T might already be set as the next track. Then this LK, I haven't got the slightest clue what that means, um, but um, LK, last, Lost a Canto, that would be Esperanto, last song, plus one. You know, I'm just guessing that to exit, so like LK plus one, to exit, it might be that you set the track 
equal to like the last track plus one. And then, you know, when it leaves, it might be like, oh, we're done the CD, right? Because it's, it's, the track's beyond the last track, and so it'll leave. That's just, that's just a guess. All right. That's just a guess. That's just a guess. Okay. Yeah. And here are these conversion routines. So I was thinking minute seconds to logical block number. You know, BM is going to be a sort of block number. And then in reverse, it's, it's converting these block number divided by 4,500. That's minutes. And then block number minus minutes times 45 divided by 75. You, you get seconds. And then DD, that's that remainder block number minus minutes times 45 minute minus seconds times 75 to get DD which is just that last little segment all right so one of the last thing one of the last routines we looked at last night was 5200 uh, 5200 which was the routine for scanning the SCSI bus which um, we don't need to go over that again um, but after scanning the SCSI bus, we arrive here at 6,000? Is it 6,000 or 60,000? Or 60,000? Let's see if there is a 60. Let's just list from the top. Um, after clearing and initializing some, va some variables, yeah, go to 60,000. It really is a 60,000. 60,000? Whoa. It really is a 60,000. All right. Let us not go there yet. Let's go back to 5,200. Scan the SCSI buffer. So 6,000, we have a whole new... We got a whole new... Routine. These are some some kind of UI based routines. So sixty six thousand rather. Six thousand clear screen. Yeah. Yeah. Um this is setting the color. This capital S is truly a clear screen. And then the name of the program and who it's written by. Print Z, that's the long one line of dashes. This is down, 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 down. While playing, please choose. This is the, uh, I think this is like the, some sort of menu that appears approximately here. And that's that, right? So clear screen, that's kind of like a main menu screen. It's kind of clear screen. Kind of like a main menu screen. Let's say draws, draw main menu. Draw, was main menu. Okay. Act screen, what's that gonna do? Act screen, so that's gonna be 6100. Act screen, active screen, action screen, I'm not sure. Action screen, we'll call it, maybe? Just to convert that to English, translate that to English. Action screen basically draws the status line. Draws status line. 
And again, <clears throat> this lowercase s is a home, not a clear. So it's just going to pop to here, go down a few lines, print the status line. So T must be um, status, track status, title status, TS. TS must be, yeah, maybe TS is, so TS dollar, TS string is maybe track status. Maybe. Okay. <clears throat> what do we got next? Um, so sixty two hundred is a whole new routine. That is init screen. Okay, init screen. Okay, so init screen's main job is to call calls clear screen and then action screen. Yeah. 6,600. Basically, init screen just calls clear screen and then action screen. FE. What did FE mean? FE is the response code. So that defaults. That's the SCSI command's response code. So that gets set back to zero, which is OK. P U something smells. P U P U equals P U zero. So P U uh, as an array could P mean puffer again for buffer, possibly puffer. Maybe P U simply stands for puffer all on its own puffer. So, but that's only nine bytes, and I don't know what's going on here with PU. I don't know. Who cares? I don't know what that's doing. Okay. So 7,000. Is another UI. Routine. 7,000. Thousand is another UI routine. Um, that scans for the HD and CD-ROM. So scan HD and CD. ROM. And of course that, this is the spot where um, it self-modifies. So the first time you run the very first version of the program, this line doesn't exist. And then uh, it will go sub 5000, which is the scan, the boss for the CMD hard drive. Uh, and if uh, FE is zero, then we're going to hop down here. But if we, if FE is not zero, we were unable to find this, the hard drive, so we print out, oh, there's no hard drive found. Here's an interesting thought. I had this uh, thought last night as well. I thought, you know, I wonder how many programs, uh, I wonder how many programs handle there being two CMD hard drives on the same IEC bus. Because you know, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't have two CMD hard drives on the same bus. And then each hard drive is its own SCSI bus. And so you could have a CD-ROM hooked up to one, one CMD hard drive, but you could have like a zip drive hooked up to another CMD hard drive. And in order to find the CD-ROM, 
you wouldn't just search for any old hard drive and then go with it because maybe it's on the second hard drive. So that is a little wrinkle that I think I'm going to handle in C64 OS. I know it's unlikely you'll have two CMD hard drives, but what if you what if you do? Bear with me for two seconds. I forgot my coffee cup in the other room. I'll be back in five seconds. with the coffee. Crucial ingredient. Alright. Yeah, so anyway, I think I'm gonna handle multiple hard drives because I'm cool. Multiple hard drives is cool. Alright, so this is going to uh, go sub 5000. Detect the hard drive. Go sub 5200. Scan the SCSI bus on the hard drive. Then we're going to print out SCSI ID, just like we, uh, that's ID, just like we thought. LUN is LU, just like we thought. Device logical unit number. Then we print out this message about the program being self modifying. Uh, okay, and then uh, and then, if you push the back arrow, it's going to jump down here. If you push any key that's not the back arrow, it just returns from this routine. So it will only do the self-mod thing if you actually push the back arrow. If you do push the back arrow, it'll come down here to do self-mod. I saw this earlier in the code when I was looking at this just very briefly. I, I also think that this is a mistake. No offense to the guy that wrote this program, but um, um, <clears throat> if so, uh, to self mod the program, he is using the trick that uh, we all know and love. Um, which I just used in IP Thief to uh, get it to load in the Sid Music. No, that's not what I did. Um, why did I do it? The booter. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Yeah, so in order to get the basic program to move itself uh, higher in memory, you can't move the basic memory pointers from inside a program that's running, that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, the, the, something really bad would happen if you were executing a program and you used the program to tell the basic interpreter that the program exists somewhere totally different in memory, okay? So what it does instead is it issues the command to move the memory, to move the, the basic memory. Excuse me. Um, It, it populates the keyboard buffer. It puts stuff on the screen and puts special characters in the buffer, uh, in, the, in the keyboard buffer, uh, so that when the program ends, the ready prompt reads out of the uh, keyboard buffer certain return keys, which run then what's been put into the screen. And so in other words, you, you, can, do th you can cause things to execute in direct mode after the program is done running which is super cool. It's a total hack, but it, it's very cool. So he does something very similar to self-modify his program. Now, why does he self-modify the program at all? Because scanning the bus, scanning for the hard drive, and then scanning all of the various devices looking for the SCSI CD-ROM is a bit slow. Honestly, I'll bet you if we write this in assembly, it won't be slow. It'll take like two seconds or one second. It'll just go, boop, boop, I found it. Um, but maybe we could write the settings, not self mod, but maybe we, maybe in our utility we could write the address of the found CD ROM to uh, the settings. 
and then maybe uh, we could simply shortcut the scanning to sort of check to see if the one, if the address and logical number that we have saved still exists. And if it does still exist, well now we're, now we're really ahead. But if it doesn't exist anymore, we could uh, then jump into the slower uh, full scan routine. But even doing a full scan, if it's implemented in assembly, I think it'll be fast. I think it'll be so fast that there's no point in even not doing it. But in any case, in basic, it's very slow. So um, once it's found, he offers, he offers this um, self-mod trick. So here's the part that I think is a mistake. In order to save audio CD player, he, uh, he first opens the uh, channel 15 on the boot device and issues a scratch of audio CD player and says delete the old file. Then um, he prints out this line to the screen. <laughs> so this is like, this is the self mod, right? He actually prints to the screen buffer a new line in the program, line 7010. And then he prints the save command to the screen, cool, with the name audio CD player, which he's just deleted the old version. And then he prints run, and then uh, he puts a bunch of stuff into the keyboard buffer. And then the program ends. Okay. So now the program ends and hits a ready prompt. Uh, and boom, it immediately runs this line, which modifies the program in memory. And then it runs this save command. The mistake is you don't have to scratch a file before you save. He could skip the scratch line, open, scratch, close. He could skip this line altogether and could instead simply inject here at colon or at zero colon. Um, and that would save with replace. It's a DOS command that's been around forever. It's shorter, it's faster, it's more reliable. Okay, we're not gonna do any of that. This is just to see how the program works. All right, 7,500 input substitute. Whoa, what's this do? Ah, this is the last routine before the main program. So what does 7,500 do? Scan for the blah, 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 and then self mod option. 7500 input substitute poke 204. Oh, for Christ's sake, what is 204? All right, so here we use our uh, complete interspace anthology again. Very conveniently, the page immediately before the Petsky table, not oh, immediately after the Petsky table, is kind of a summary uh, C64 memory map. So that was 204 in decimal. So 204 in decimal. Aha, that controls the flashing of the cursor. So zero equals flash cursor. Zero, he pokes a zero in there. He wants the cursor to flash. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. That is also a very cool trick. Oh, I like it. I've never seen anybody do that before. Because the very next thing he's going to do is a get, a dollar sign. And then if a dollar sign is plus, so the, the get a dollar sign return instantaneously. And if there was no key that had been waiting around in the buffer, a, a string is going to be blank. 
So if a string's blank, aka there was nothing in the buffer, it just immediately loops to grab something from the buffer again. So this just, boo -doo 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 -doo, this just loops forever until you push a key. But it looks like this is going to make the cursor blink while you're waiting. I like that. Let's let's try that out. So let's make a new program. We'll go 10, poke 204, comma 0, 20, we'll go get a string, and we'll go if a string is blank, then 20, and we'll go 30 for an a string, just for fun. So let's see how that's going to run. Look at that! <laughs> The cursor's blinking. I like it. Very clever. Now we'll push any key, like T, boom. Oh, that is cool. Remember that, folks. There's a lesson right there. Poke 2040. Turn the blinking cursor on even when you're in an infinite loop. <laughs> clever. Clever. 7,000. No, that was 7,500. Was it 7,200? Yeah, 7,500. 7,500. Input. Yeah, so this is his actual... This is every time he wants to get input. This is his input routine. Yeah, basic is funny, right? Because it only has two forms of input. It's got the input statement, but the input statement is, tor is terrible because um, it never leaves, it goes into some sort of full screen editing mode and it never leaves it until you hit return. But then what's worse is that you can cursor away and you can go fuck around with things on the screen. It's, 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 input is an extremely basic way to get user input. And if you want to have any control whatsoever, you have to use get dollar sign and then do a bunch of manipulations yourself. But what what's what's always been a pain is that the cursor doesn't blink. So that's a good trick. Okay. <clears throat> so a dollar sign. I think we already had did we encounter a dollar sign before? A string rather. No. So let's call a uh, yeah, we did. A and A string were used temporarily as our input and output parameters for the conversion routine. Thirty six hundred. Okay. So we're gonna get one character in A, so W, A, string will be A. Then if the value of A is zero, we're gonna go to 7595, which is going to, so if we push zero, if the value of A stir is zero, how does that work? Does that mean that if we go A stir equals zero, and then we print value a stir, that's zero, okay, and if this was one, would the value of a stir be one? Yeah, okay, okay, <clears throat> okay, so value of a stir is going to be zero if it actually, you actually pushed zero. And if you alphanumeric or zero, alphanumeric or zero. Oh yeah, that is interesting. So if we go a dollar sign equals uh, like t, no, like t or, or uh, z maybe. And then we go print the vowel of a stir. Now that's also zero. I see. I see. That's because you can do funky shit like this, right? You can go like 12Z. And then when you print this, it's gonna be 12. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right. So that's an hour. And 
we're still not all the way through the program. But what the hell, eh? We, we can do this for another hour. Um, okay. Yeah, so he's got... The, this program is really, really well commented, really well commented. So alphanumeric or zero. So if you push a letter, so we're gonna we're gonna get our input. If we push a letter, um, we're gonna leave. Or if you push zero, we're gonna leave by by popping down to seven five ninety five, which stops the cursor blinking and returns. Uh, but if we push anything other than uh, a letter or zero, aka we push one, two, three, etc., we're going to uh, print the character that we. Um, I'm going to print the character that we pushed. And we're going to get another character. Uh-huh. And so if the ASCII of that character is 13, that's a return, we're done. In other words, if you push one return, W A will be one. And that's it. It's just gonna return and W A will be one. However, if you push one, then we fall down here. And then you push something that is <clears throat> less than forty-eight. Or greater than 57, well, uh, then it's going to go back to 7550 and grab again, because if we just quickly look, so four, four, 4857, 4857 in decimal, 48 is 0 to 57. Is, so basically, um, 48 to 57 in decimal are the Petsky string values for pet, the Petsky values for the string Petsky character 0 to uh, 9. So after we've pushed our first key, let's say it's 1. We go, oh, one, but we may have two digit tracks. So it sticks one into WA, and then it comes down into here, and then you get to push a second character. So you push a second character of, say, four, and it will append four onto, uh, it will append four onto W A. Then it will go to on a whole other line instead of just doing it here. It will go to 7545, which will print out the second character that you pushed and allow you to push another one. Right, 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 right. So this allows you to push multiple numbers. Boom, 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 boom. Until, and it keeps appending the digits onto WA until you hit return. So WA, WA, stir is like uh, the input string. which could be just one character, uh, or it could be multiple characters if they are numeric. 
And that is 7,500, which is our sort of uh, advanced input. Input uh, routine. And lastly, we get to um, 60,000, which we've already said is the main program. So we're pretty darn close to uh, going through the whole thing. Let's just see where 60,000 takes us. 60,000. Okay. So 60,000 is, is the... Basically 60,000 is the true main menu. So let's just see what it'll let us do. So 60,000 jumps to 7,000. 7,000 scans the buses for uh, the hard drive and the CD-ROM, as it says. TS. T. S. TS might be, I don't have anything written for TS. Track status. Status text. It's text status or text string or textual status. In any case, go sub 6200 initializes the screen and probably prints out text status. Let's go back to 6200. Does it print out? It does 6,000, which clears the screen with the main menu, and then it does 6,100, which prints the status line. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So it prints, uh, please insert a CD, and uh, go subs 6,200 to init the screen. FE, it sets to 8, which is target busy. Then it goes up to 2040. 2040 is the read the table of contents routine. Okay, we'll come back to that. No, it's not. 2040 is the test unit ready. Indeed, like the comment says. Yeah, okay. Okay. 6100 is the action screen which prints out the status line again. Um, okay. And then, if FE is greater than zero, we loop back. So we basically, we have our status line of please insert a CD. So it's going to test to see if the unit's ready. It's gonna print out that status line, etc until the unit is ready. Next, sets our status text. So TS is not track status, it's, it's status text. It's status text. That's cool. Status text, which can be output with a call to 61, which draws the action screen with the status line drawn. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, so next we're going to read the table of contents. So it actually sets the status to reading table of contents. Goes up 6100 to put that on the screen. Next, it goes up 2400. That's the read the table of contents subroutine. SCSI command to do that. 
And assuming that that worked, then it's going to set the status to uh, please choose. And it's going to output that to the, with the action screen. Next, we are going to loop 0 to 5, print L. This is going to be five blank lines. Five blank lines. And then we're going to print Q, 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 which is going to go up. So it's going to clear five lines. It's going to move the cursor back up. And then it's going to move the cursor. Um, I don't know what the hell that is, but these are just, it's going to basically just print this UI into the space, this whole UI into the space. Okay. Then we're going to say all or title F K L K. I'm going to go out on a limb because I speak Esperanto and Esperanto borrows from German that K stands for Canto and that Canto is the word for song and so FK has got to be first Canto LK has got to be lost a Canto last song, first song, last song why? because this is right in the UI, right? for first track, last track and that actually makes a lot of sense. So first, FK is going to be first track. I'm just going to pop this in here somewhere. Go like this. So F K is first uh, track. L K. It's going to be last track, and now we know precisely why when you're in that read subroutine, when you're in that read sub channel and you push uh, the back arrow, it set T for track, so let's say T is going to equal track. It set track equal to LK plus 1, which is exactly what my guess was, it's going to set it to be um, last track, plus one. That's going to force it to stop playing because uh, you're beyond the end of the tracks. Yeah, nice. So I'm going to, we're going to guess, we're going to go back later and look at um, reading the table of contents, but it's almost certainly going to be the one that sets first track and last track. Go sub 7500, what's that all about? Ah advanced input, of course. So it prints out this user, this, this menu, it says please choose, sends that in a status line, clears out the next so many lines, prints out this sort of main menu with a little bit of dynamism about how many tracks we've got. Then it goes to our advanced input and now it starts interpreting what it is that we typed. So if we typed if we typed uh, A, we're going to go sub 6,500, 60,500. That is going to um, start playing all. You know what? I need another page. I need another page. I'll tell you why. Because I ran out of space for my variables and I started putting variables here. But you know what? I thought I was done with all my routines, but I'm not done with my routines. So I'm going to erase this. I'm going to move this to a new page. Just these variables to a new page. Transcribe. So this will be page number one. This is going to be our SCSI. CD player, basic, page two, we have our routines, continued, and we have our variables, variables, 
also continued. Just in case these two pieces of paper get separated from one another. Now let's transcribe these variables. So we have FK is first track. LK the last track. T is track. Let us erase this stuff from the first page. Yeah, we'll leave that line there and call it main. main program. Okay. So sixty. 1500 is gonna play all yeah let's 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 do it let's hop down to 60,500 see what we find there um, indeed 60,500 Okay, let's let's just put that in here. Sixty thousand five hundred is play all. Oh wow, very interesting. Very interesting. Indeed, the program is responsible for moving between the tracks. So track equals FK to LK. And now we know why setting track equal to LK plus one is gonna break out of this loop because when it returns to this loop, T will already be beyond LK and that will indeed break out of the loop. Okay. All right, so hold on here. So uh, T is gonna start at first track and it's gonna go to last track. 3,500 was MFS to LBN. Look at this, REM, LBN for title end, logical block number for title for track end. BN is going to be block number equals, so LBN actually sets BN. So block number equals block number minus one. LBN of title end. Okay. Okay. 3500 did what? MFS2 LBN. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. 3540 indeed changes LBN to MFS, so logical block file, logical block number to MFS minutes colon seconds. MR equals T minus one. Count from zero. NR Oh my word. Oh my word. Fuck. Now I understand why T, I get it. Oh man, fuck. <laughs> okay. All right, so when play subchannel ends, which is this 2800 is subchannel, yeah, play subchannel. Oh, play subchannel, read subchannel. 
is actually what happens whilst playing one track. You're reading the information about that track. And if you push plus, it breaks out of there, and all that happens is that it, it nexts through the for loop, right? So nexting through the for loop auto increments t to the next track. But if we want to go back a track, we have to subtract 2. Why do we subtract 2? So we subtract 2 from the current track so that when this next loops to the, that will increment t and that'll take us to the next track. Amazing. That's that's how that, that's why because it's inside a for loop on track. Okay, that makes sense. I like it when things make sense. Thirty-five, uh, thirty-five forty is definitely going to be this logical block number to MFS. Still not entirely sure about that. NR equals T minus one. So NR must be like, um, yeah, count from zero. NR is like a zero based index for the track, perhaps. Then 2700 play MFS. Right. Play. MFS. Okay. 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 So thirty five hundred LBN for title. We gotta go look at 3500 again. This 3500. 3500 ultimately sets a block number. Uh, yes, indeed, it references track. Okay, okay. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Now I really know what's going on. So when we read in our table of contents, it's going to populate this track data two-dimensional array. So the first index is your track, and the second uh, element, seven bytes, is some information about not only how long is the track, but what's the start position of the track. As though, ah, yeah, right. It's as though the data stored on the CD is one long, continuous PCM audio file. Just one enormously long PCM audio, audio file. But you have this table of contents that gives you numbered tracks and seven bytes of data. So you have sort of three bytes in logic, and, and they are, um, you have three bytes in logical block numbers. You have, you have a three byte, uh, or 24 bit number measured in logical blocks. And a logical block is precisely 175th of a second. So how many seconds would 24 
bits give us? So, 2 to the power of 24 is 16 million. Divided by 75 gives us how many seconds there could be. That is 223,000 seconds. We'll divide that by 60 to give us 3,728 minutes. Divided by 60 again to give us 62 hours, which is obviously longer than a CD can play for. But on the flip side, um, two bytes might just not be long enough, right? So let's go um, 2 to the power of 16, 65,536. Why I had to type that in, don't ask me. And let's uh, divide that by 75. Now we have 873 seconds. We're going to divide that by 60 minutes. Now we have only 14 minutes. And that is the reason we need three bytes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, we're now figuring out the way CDs are encoded because, uh, because of the way this works. So let's take a guess at the way CDs are encoded. You have a continuous block of PCM data, just this huge just block of continuous PCM data. But it is stored in blocks of data that are 2,300 and I can't remember, 52 maybe bytes. Now that's not round, but maybe there's some sort of checksum on one of those blocks that makes up the extra space. And that, and maybe even padding, because maybe it's just not round. So you, uh, and that amount of data, given the 44.1 kilohertz, 16 bit stereo nature of the PCM data, gives you precisely 1 75th of a second of audio. So now what you have is um, uh, you have one block, you get uh, one seventy-fifth of a second, but you just have block after block after block after block in a giant sequence of blocks. Um, but uh, which played end to end would be basically the entire album. But uh, if you, so now you, you can number your blocks, but if you used only one byte, you could only have 255 blocks, which would give you like, you know, so many seconds of audio. If you had two bytes uh, to, to a 16 bit number to represent your block count, that at 1 75th of a second per block, you will only have enough for uh, 14 minutes of audio, which obviously a CD can play more than 14 minutes of audio. So we need a third byte. We need a 24 bit block number. Uh, even though uh, if you maxed out the 24 bits, okay, well, that's more than a CD can hold, but you know. You need three bytes in order to be able to represent um, uh, the number of blocks that there could be. And so then you have, so, so you have this uninterrupted numeric sequence of blocks, but then you have the table of contents. The table of contents is seven bytes. Table of contents is seven bytes, which gives you three bytes to represent the starting block, logical block number for the start of the track, 
and you get three blocks to represent the last block or the number of blocks, depending. And then you get one byte left over for something else. I don't know what that other thing is, but uh, yeah. Okay, so now it actually starts to make sense what, what happens here. So, so the so read table of contents is basically reading in the three byte start block, the three byte end block for a track, plus some other data byte. And then it does that for up to 36 tracks. And so when we say give me MFS now oh, hold on um, hold on let's just list uh, 16500 okay uh, sorry so the first thing so we have a track that we want to play and it calls uh, 3500 which is the logical block for the title's end. Okay. 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 So we so T is set to the track that we're trying to be on. So let's go to thir so 3500 is MFS. 2LBN. Really, it didn't look like that a second ago. 3500. It's MFS 2LBN. Um, okay. So this is the table of contents for our track. So 5, 6, and 7. This is actually taking, I mean, I'm just guessing about what that table of contents held. It actually is multiplying a length of time to compute a block number. And, but then what it was going to do is it's going to subtract a block number. Right? Right? So MFS actually, I don't know why it's called MFS to LBN, because it's actually data that's in the table, that was read into the table of contents, which is being converted into a block number. And then we promptly subtract one from the block number in, in the play all routine. Then the block number gets converted to MFS, which is not really accurate. It's actually setting MM and SS and DD based on the block number. So this MFS to LBN is more like table of contents MFS to the logical block number. And then we're turning around and saying, now take the logical block number and convert that into minutes, seconds, and fractions of a second. Is that right? So let's go back to 60. 
1,500. But then, change LBN to MFS, but then to actually play, it jumps to 2,700, which is play MFS. Okay, so let's jump to 20, play MFS, 27, 2,700. Yeah, okay, 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 okay. Isn't that interesting? So to play, we issue a SCSI command that includes the track number, zero based track number, the five, the six, and the seven. which are the values that came out of the table of contents that were used to convert to LBN only to have LBN be subtract one and then get converted into minutes, seconds, and sub-seconds, and for them to get tacked onto the SCSI command. So it's like the SCSI command to so play MFS, it's as though we're computing the start and end of the song, and then we're issuing a command that says, play the audio data between these two time signatures. Except that we're passing it in as MFS, not as a block number. So that's a bit weird. And then uh, let's go back to 60,500. Start playing, and then we output, so we start it playing, and now the CD's playing. Then we output playing all into the status, uh, whatever. And then 2800 is that um, subcommand routine. Read subcommand, subchannel rather, read subchannel. So read subchannel, subcommand, till title end. Yeah, right. And then after we leave this, if TF equals one, TF is like track failure. Yeah, we set that whilst, whilst in subchannel, whilst scanning to see where it is in the playback. If you get an FE, if you get a status response that's not okay, we set TF equals one. So TF is kind of like track fill, track failure. TF equals track failure during playback. Um, then we go t equals last track plus one. Why do we do that? Because that will cause the next to break out of the loop. You know you don't have to do that, right? Or do you have to do that? Yeah, maybe you maybe you do have to do this to properly break out of a loop without leaking memory. Yeah, maybe you do. Because the four probably pushes its address onto the stack. And then the next 
probably returns to that address on the stack. And then the four, if it's not done, probably pushes itself on the stack again or something. And so if you simply go to or go sub to 3100, it would probably leak memory. All right. And of course, plus and minus. So plus and minus are going to simply manipulate t, but considering that it's going to be incremented by the 4. Hitting the back arrow is going to do this, setting it to last channel, last song plus 1. And so finally it's going to jump to 3100, which is the command to start or stop the unit. Stop the unit. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. So... So according to this, you are not going to be able to... You are not going to be able to change a track unless the program is running, right? Right, 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 whoops, sorry, let's go back 60,500. think about that, don't we? Because it is in fact the it is in fact the basic program that's looping over the tracks converting the table of contents data into the start and end times and then sending and then sending a SCSI command telling it to play from here to here and when it reaches the end uh, it increments T for the next track and then it recomputes the time coordinates for the next track, and it goes into 2800. Uh, let's go back to 2800 for a second because not because but because yeah, look at this. Now we know what this NR is. NR is um, track minus one. And track minus one was the previous track. So we grab five, six, and seven to figure out play address of perhaps the end of the previous track. And then PE is the end of this track. Therefore, the play total is the end of this track minus the end of the previous track, divided by 4,500, and then convert that 
number into a minutes and seconds thing. That's how you know how long the track is. Well, fuck a duck. And then this command, in fact, is saying this command is asking us where are we in the whole world or within this one track so 13 14 and 15 was um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah it's hard to say exactly what that is it's hard to say whether this is um, where the playhead is inside the entire stretch of this contiguous giant PCM, or whether it's where you are within the play range that you have commanded it to play. Yeah. You know what, though? I'm, I'm going to, before proceeding... We're at one hour, 46 minutes. Before proceeding with um, the rest of the play routines, I would like to now check out the table of contents. So we're gonna go list 2400. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna decode this for the next 10 minutes or so. Okay, again, this is some wacky command I don't understand. Alright, so we're going to send the command. We're going to compose the command and send the command. So BL is block length at the 2000 some odd block length and with 250 yeah so, so so this is telling it to grab a chunk of data from the disk perhaps okay now F E is anything but zero. It's going to jump to 2600. So if it's anything but okay, it's going to jump to 2600. 2600 is just going to return. Okay. <clears throat> Otherwise, we're going to read the titles. Yeah. Mm hmm so sufficient for 36 titles. That's correct. TD is only 36 uh, spots long. So we have enough for 36 possible titles. Okay, that's fair. Most CDs don't have more than 36 titles. Some do, but most don't. I, I, okay, it's just an index. We're gonna open channel 15. You know, B equals zero to I, I, B equals zero to one? All right. Then we're gonna do a memory read. 
and our memory read is going to read from the low byte address, that's zero I think, of 3000, that's zero, to MH plus B. So this would be pages of memory. This would be bytes within the pages. So we're always going to be page aligned because ML is zero. Okay. And so we're going to read MH plus B. That's a page. So we're basically specifying page offsets. Char zero, as we read in our manual, in our um, SCSI command manual yesterday, but zero will give you precisely 256 bytes. Next, we loop from zero to 255, and we get a byte, and we put it into our buffer in mem main memory to be B times 256, okay, makes sense, plus I, okay, the ASCII conversion of that. Yeah, okay, so basically we're going to load in one page of memory into our buffer. Oh, and by the way, oh, I see why this is going to one. I, I, goes to one. So we loop from zero to one. It's only going to do it twice because we memory read twice. And uh, the buffer, PE buffer is only 512 bytes. So we do this table of contents thing, command, and we read in 512 bytes into PI, PE buffer. And we convert all those things to numbers. And then we close the channel. So that's pretty easy, right? I mean, God, that's that's the whole SCSI command. Basically, we just read in 512 bytes. It says it's enough for 36 titles. Is it enough for 36 titles? So what's 36 times 7? 252. I mean that's that's less that's that's less than one page. I don't quite know why we need two pages. Um, okay. Unless the page, unless the data in the table of contents is 15 or 16 bytes, but we only care to extract seven of them. So if it was like 15 bytes times 32, times 36, what's 512 divided by uh, 36? 14. Yeah, so maybe if it was up to 14 bytes per table of contents entry, and we have support for 36 titles, that would be, you know, 512 bytes. That would be closer to 512 bytes. And so, but the point is, it's pretty easy. We do the SCSI command, and then we simply read it all into a buffer, which is harder to do in basic than it is to do in assembly. And we close the channel, and we're done with the channel. We're done with the uh, we're done with reading data from. Uh, yeah, we're done with reading data from. Uh, SCSI, SCSI device. So now what do we do? Track number equals p zero times two fifty six plus p one. So TN is the number of tracks. T 
n is number of tracks. Not only that, but we know that, so we, we, make, we made that SCSI command, we read the 512 bytes in, and the first two bytes are 16-bit uh, big endian uh, uh, why is it big endian because the lower the lower byte gets multiplied by 256 so that that means that the first byte that in the buffer is actually the high byte so it's it's a high byte first it's most significant byte first so it's big endian Excuse me, it's big and So now we know how many tracks there are. So we know the length of the table of contents. Very good. And therefore, uh, the first track is PE2. The last track is PE3. Really? Does that make any sense? n is the length of the table of contents. Is that in track numbers, which is what I wrote down, or is that in bytes? I may have written that down wrong. So first track, PE0, PE2 rather. I don't get that either. I mean, Really? Isn't the first track just always one? I don't know what's going. I don't know what that is. And the last track, we had three. Not sure about that either. So now we're gonna loop. We'll go for i equals the first track minus one. So if first track is one, we're gonna say i is zero to last track. a blank line. I don't know why it's doing that. Read start and end times. Yes indeed. Start and end times. So we go I I is zero to seven. Yeah, that was something I misinterpreted, but we just figured that out earlier that when we say when we give uh, subscript in here it's if we say seven it doesn't mean that there are seven bytes it's actually zero to seven so there's actually eight bytes so we loop zero to seven eight bytes per title and then we go okay table of contents is I that's the first track and then we go i i, that's the first byte of the first track, is equal to p e four. Okay, this would be easier in uh, in assembly as well. But this is basically we skip the first four bytes of the buffer, and then we go i times eight because the table of contents are in eight byte blocks plus i i to grab that byte that's it that's how we parse out the table of contents that's it that's how we type that's how we parse out the table of contents and that is two hours so you know i'm pretty close to understanding how the whole thing works I really, I really am pretty close to understanding how the whole thing works. But let's jump down to um, 60,000 again. Because I wanted to see... Um, so if we do... Um, so A goes to 6,500. Back arrow means we're going to quit. So 3100 3, stops the unit, probably stops the CD from spinning or something. Um, and then uh, it ends. R is going to do random. So 68, 
6,800. It's random play. 60,800. Random play. Um, P is going to play all. So we got 60,700. He's going to play all. with exit. This play all was track at a time. Track by track. Uh, or we can play an individual track. So TF equals 1, TF equals 0, go to 6050, there was an error while playing. Otherwise, uh, if so we convert our two-digit number that we typed in into a number, if it's less than the first track or greater than the first track, we uh, branch back up to the menu system because you can't select one of those. Otherwise, what we do is T has now a specific track that we've chosen. So we jump to 3500, which converts a number into another number, MFS to LBN. And then uh, we do this BN equals BN minus one. So we've kind of seen this logic inside the play all track by track routine. Then we go sub 3540, which converts BN back into MFS. We do NR equals track minus one, and then we jump to go play that track, and then it says playing, and it goes and it plays MFS, which it plays basically the, the track number that, that the, the range was specified. 2800 does the subchannel thing, but as soon as the subchannel thing is done, including if you hit plus, it's going to then go to 3100, which stops the unit. And then it's like, if there was an error, it's going to leave um, P1 equals 21, let's go to 6140, otherwise track equals track plus 1, if it's less than the last track, then jump to 230, yeah, so this is kind of like another loop that's going to start, that, that's basically if you started a track, it's going to compute where that track is, and then it's going to start going through the tracks one at a time until you hit the end, but it'll also let you hit back a track. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Enough sense. 65... 60,500 was what we just looked at. How about 60,000? Um, yeah, so we've already looked at that one. 60,700 is going to play the entire CD. And so, how it does that is it sets the track to the last track. And then it goes up 3,500 to get last track and then it'll grab BN equals BN minus one and then it converts BN LBN to MFS and then it says that the current track is going to be the first track minus one and then it starts playing yeah, exactly, exactly. So when we say we want to play the entire CD and we want to exit, what it does is it uses the table of contents to look up 
the end position of the last track and the first position of the first track. And then it converts those into these MFS numbers and then it does play MFS except instead of providing the start and stop figures for a track that we pulled out of the table of contents, it tells it to start playing from the MFS of the first track to the MFS of the last track, the end MFS of the last track. And so now the CD-ROM is no longer caring about what track it's on. It's playing through from the start time signature to the end time signature of the entire disc, which is why it doesn't need to keep being told what to do. Yeah. So we need to figure out what is going to happen. We need to figure out what... We need to tell it what's going to happen when... We need to tell it what's going to happen. Right, I mean, let's say you open a CD playing utility in C64 OS and it loads in the list of tracks and you pick one track and say I just want to listen to this one track and then as it's playing you close the player now it's gonna play from the, it's gonna play that range of audio you've asked it to play but when it hits the end of that range of audio the CD is just gonna stop and your CD player is not open anymore. And so... And so, you know, if you, and even if it was in the middle of that track and you reopened your CD player, uh, how would the CD player know where you I mean, I suppose it could reread in the table of contents. Then it could ask the CD, hey, where are you playing? And if you are playing, and if you are playing, it could figure out what track you're in the middle of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so random. Random's a whole other kettle of fish. Because, look at that, this is the very last thing that there even, even is to, to, to know in this program. And then we'll call it quits, because we're over two hours. But this is literally the last part. Yeah, the random is done by basic. I mean, we I barely even have to walk through this. I just, I know what it's going to do. I mean, the point is... It gets a random track number between the start and end track numbers. Then it convert, and then it's just into one doing one track. It converts that one track to NLBN, and then it does this minus thing to figure out the end of the title, and then it figures out the MFS. Yeah, so somehow I, I think I understand. I think I, I think I understand. It, whatever track you want to play, it, it's like the track number is actually one more than the one you want to play. So then it goes and it does this. Okay, let's get the block number for the start of the next track. That's why we do block number minus one, because that actually gives us the block number of the final block of the, of the track we actually want to play. And then we figure out the some sort of starting MFS and NR is the track we're actually playing. And now we've got 
somehow the start and end signatures. And then we go and we play MFS. We play from signature to signature. That's just one track. And then we uh, do this sub channel thing, which tells us where we are within the track, which is fine. But if you hit the button that says next track, it just says, did you not push the back arrow? And was there not a failure? In which case it loops back up to here and it just picks another random track. So whether you put, pick forward a track or back a track when you're in this mode, it doesn't really matter. All it does is loops back up to here, picks a new random track and figures out where it is and plays it again. So I would say that when our CD player routine in uh, C64 OS is not running, there's no way in hell it's going to be able to play random, because it's not running. Unless you did some sort of terminate and stay resident thing, that would be cool. But otherwise, I'm thinking when you open the player and you load in the table of contents, you could then immediately do an inquiry to the disk to figure out whether the disk is um, uh, playing. And then you could use that to figure out uh, which track it's based on the table of contents. You could figure out which track it's in. And so even while it's playing in the background and the program gets closed, you reopen the program, you could probably refigure out from a request from the disk where it is and say, oh, I'm in this track. Okay? I'm also thinking, I know this sounds crazy, but. I'm thinking that constantly polling the SCSI device to figure out where it is in the song is madness. And that it would make more sense to just have some sort of a C64 OS timer that runs and updates the time. Anyway. That is the complete reverse engineering, that, that, that's a complete walkthrough of the program. So we know all the parts of the program, we have a very good idea about how it works. We haven't figured out the technicals, like we don't know, you know, we haven't started to, we haven't attempted to write our own version of this. I mean, the next thing to do will be to, in basic, extract the nitty gritty bit, like get rid of all the UI because we're going to be replacing the entire UI. So what we want to do, our next step will be just get rid of all the UI, extract only the bits we give a shit about. Really, really, really understand this LBN to MFS thing right down to the, the actual uh, bits and bytes of it. Re-implement our own kind of sloppy or, or headless version of just the SCSI commands and then experiment with that so that we understand just the raw guts. And that will become the heart of the player that will convert into assembly. But that's for another day. So uh, thank you all for bearing with me and I hope that somebody in this universe uh, finds this kind of deep dive into a basic program um, but a basic program that's pretty interesting nonetheless. Uh, hopefully somebody will find that interesting. And uh, thanks for watching.